Hello and welcome to another episode of the QT Cast, the official podcast for the Queer and Trans Research Lab at the Mark S. Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies. My name is Elliot and I'll be your host. Well, actually, more of a co-host today. In this episode, I sit down with Rings and Tangs project lead Tatiana Ferguson, project research assistant Jade Nielsen, and project community consultants Ava Simone and Vanessa Carter. Stay tuned to hear about the process of creating research by, with, and for Black trans women, the role of community in the Rings and Tanks project, and also the general absence from an academic archive of Black trans women's positive experiences, kinships, and relations. Oh, and you'll get the scoop on a dating game being developed for African, Caribbean, or Black trans women coming later this year. You'll also be getting to sit in on an enlightening and open conversation about love, attraction, bravery, intergenerational guidance, and how community can hold, and even at times fracture, sense of identity. I'm so grateful for the stories our guests share with us in this episode, and I hope you are too. You can find a full transcript by following the link in the episode notes, and you can find links to learn more about the projects discussed, our guests, and the Queer and Trans Research Lab in the episode notes as well. Please share this episode with your networks, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and follow us on social for more. Just a heads up to listeners, this conversation does at times address violence against Black trans women, abusive relationships, and the trauma of anti-Black racism. Please take care while you listen. Oh, one last thing. Tatiana had asked me to share, for any of our listeners who may not know, that tangs is an ethnic Caribbean way of saying the word things. Okay, without further delay, come hang with us on the QT cast. Hi everyone, Tatiana Ferguson here, co-founder of the Democracy Collective. I'm also a community leader in residency for the Current Council Lab. I'm here today with a few of the consultants on my project, uh, Transcending Love, Rings and Things. Uh, we also have the RA here, so I'll allow them to introduce themselves. I'm starting with you, Eva. How are you? Who are you? Uh, who am I? I'm just me. <laughs> my name is Eva Simone. I'm a trans advocate and performing artist. Um, those things are kind of like phasing out and I'm looking for where I'm going to be land next. But at the moment, they're still like um, one of the things. My advocacy is around um, HIV AIDS and um, gender diversity. And uh, I think that's it. We also have Vanessa, Vanessa Carter. How are you? Who are you? Hi, guys. I'm Vanessa Carter. Um, I'm a peer leader with harm reduction skills, and I'm a trans advocate for everything Black. Work. Um, R.A. Jade Nielsen. Hi, I'm Jade. I am working on Rings and Kings as an R.A., um, part of the Bottom Center for Sexual Diversity Studies. Um, I'm finishing my undergraduate at U of T, a double majoring in history and sexual diversity studies. I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Thank you so much. Before we get into the thick of it, Tatiana, would you mind just giving our listeners um, another rundown of what Rings and Tings is, um, what they can expect from the project? And then if we just want to jump into a little bit about the development story, that would be awesome. Sure. So Transcending Love, Rings and Things is a community-led project uh, the sixth exam, the key motivators for African Caribbean and Black trans women as they negotiate uh, relationships and love. Uh, we're exploring the themes of sex, love, and marriage in this project among trans women, Black trans women who are single, in relationships, or married um, in a very innovative way uh, using digital technologies, using art based approaches. And it's very much like community informed. So I have uh, four consultants that's helping me to shape the project. The study is live. It, it went live last year, last November, and we're still collecting data on um, African Caribbean and Black trans women in Canada. So that's a little bit about the project on, on what we hope to do with the findings. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, can I just ask, ask a question about relationship? Is it being defined um, romantically or are platonic relationships being explored as well? Yeah, I think for us, when we think about relationship, it's it's multifaceted. So uh, there's a lot of self-determination, um, you know, and relationship dynamics look different. So it's it's sexual relationship, it's uh, non-sexual relationships, uh, but it, it is intimate. It does involve the element of intimacy. We're not looking so much at friendships and social relationships. We're looking at how folks are uh, developing or exploring uh, relationships through sex, love, and marriage in this project with others. And Ava and Vanessa, um, would you both mind telling me a little bit about your experience as a consultant in this project um, and what some of the conversations you've been having are? Eva, you go. I always seem to be the one that's 
jumping in. So I wanted to give you um, that um, opportunity to jump in. Well, um, the project so far, we've had like really just off the cuff conversations that really explore the idea of how trans women in particular um, experience relationships and how, how sometimes they can be they can be non-conventional in the way that we experience relationships as well as conventional. And, um, and that looks like the kind of barriers that we come up against as, as mostly black and immigrant people and the kind of biases that comes with, with those things. And intersection, from an inter, intersectional lens, I should frame it as. And it's very interesting to to hear each our own experiences, as well as the kind of anecdotal experiences of our peers. Well, for me, um, this experience have taught me that my love language is touch. <laughs> I would thought it would have been um, material things, but my love language is touch and that sort of stuff. And also how other people see their, see their selves, their spouse and the people that they attract and how they go about their life um, interacting with um, the dating pool and how it how hard it is and um, how, how sorry how difficult it is being a trans woman and dating. Jade can I ask a little bit about your experience as an RA on this project? Yeah um, my experience has been pretty awesome at least uh, for me. Um, I've been learning a lot from um, how to go through the process of creating a project like this. Um, this is really different from kind of the orthodox academic way of uh, or I guess system. This is very much community based, um, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, it's been really interesting learning about how to create focus groups, how to create these surveys, um, thinking about who you're focusing on and how to uh, create da data. Um, it's also been just uh, really interesting to hear about experiences, especially when we're having like our um, uh, our meetings amongst us. Um, I've also learned my own love language, which has been pretty cool. And um, yeah, honestly, I've just it's been a really awesome learning experience for me. Um, and it's cool that I've gotten to work hands on as well, not just listening, but actually doing things too. And Tatiana, last but certainly not least, what's your experience been like um, as the project lead for this? It's been amazing. Um, I'm challenging myself to be more innovative with how I engage uh, community in this work and what this community basically really mean for me. Um, so there are, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, so we, we did do a uh, literature review and environmental scan. So this is very much um, using existing knowledge on African Caribbean and Black continent experiences, but also hounding in on the things that's often omitted or missing from research. We've had a lot of conversations about um, appearance and it was uh, a big part of our work actually was unpacking what does that mean to, to be Black and beautiful? Like what are the standards or the expectations of Black trans women and, and how that could intersect with racism, how that could intersect with misogyny? Uh, could intersect with uh, transphobia uh, when um, Black trans women's identities is always being juxtaposed uh, next to other identities. So next to cisgender people, next to white people, um, next to uh, non-Black people. And yeah, I think it's been a very innovative process and I'm still being very creative when I think about knowledge translation. I've been talking a lot about this dating game and the dating game isn't what you expect. I think a lot of times people don't want that you know, that quick fix, the match, the matchmaker. So no, this thing game isn't gonna be like that, but it's going to really um, use the evidence that has been gathered uh, to inform the community as well as to continue to raise awareness about issues that affect uh, this demographic of women. That's so exciting. And what's the timeline gonna be for the dating game or is it still in development? Like how much can you share for our listeners right now? Yeah, like it's still very much in development. There are like several concepts, um, that I'm exploring at the moment, um, but I hope to launch it. I will be actually testing it with um, the trans youth group organization that I've worked with in the past, the 519 that is here in Toronto, Canada. So there's a trans youth group and um, one of the coordinators had invited me there uh, 
to do a workshop. And I was like, oh, this is a good opportunity for me to see how folks respond to uh, one of the suggestions or one or two of the suggestions for the dating game um, without using the actual research findings, but the general concept. So yeah, but the actual game would go, would should be going live this spring. And um, yeah, I hope folks are interested in engaging in, in this experience with us. I'll make sure to keep our listeners up to date and informed on that so they can, they cannot miss that because I'm sure they won't want to. I want to circle back for a second, Ava, to something that you had said um, about both the unorthodox and the orthodox ways that trans women navigate relationships. I was wondering if you could give a little bit more detail on that. Well, um, in the orthodox way, it's usually centered around um, cisset identities so, and how those either are seen as from a heterosexist lens or heterosexual lens uh, and or uh, queer lens. And sometimes trans relationships are more beyond the intersections of being trans. It's, it's, it's more diverse in the way that we experience relationships. That I know, I know uh, a lot of trans women who date other trans women and or cisset women. Um, I, I know of trans women who date exclusively cisset men. I know of trans folks who date um, cisset and trans men. So there's a diversity in the way that we experience relationships and it will, it will kind of shape the way that we experience it and how we, we navigate our relationship. And this next question, I just want to toss out to the whole group. Generally, what is something that you hope to learn um, and or teach through this project? I would love for everyone to know that love is fluid. And there's no wrong or right way. We can all love each other. What I have learned coming from a background in the Caribbean and the roles are very heterosexual. Um, coming up here, it has opened my mind to really think about giving somebody else that you want to see as a potential mate or lover a chance. And I found out within myself that I'm very attracted to trans men. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think it's interesting, like both Eva and Vanessa shared, I think it's an exploration. Uh, there are common notions of, you know, what uh, trans women's experiences in general, but when that interacts with blackness, it's like, we're, we're, this project is really centering those experiences. And there is fluidity, fluidity in, in gender, in gender roles, in, um, positions and, and ways people are in, in those relationships. So I think it was important for this project to explore that. Like, whilst there are, I would say, our findings do suggest um, there is some heteronormativity at play, there's also variety. So um, there are trans women who also identify as non-binary. So uh, even trans womanhood is not singular. Uh, there is this range. Uh, and we also explore um, some of the surgical procedures. So sometimes people are, I think that's where the conversation often goes when we talk about transness. Um, and there are trans people who don't desire surgical intervention, whereas there are some who have had it and, and others who are in that process. So I think it's been a unique way of us capturing all of this rich information on like sex and sexuality, on dating preferences, um, and really using community voice to inform how we collect that information. Can I, can I just jump in for a minute on what Tatiana say, say, said about how the focus usually is, is the journey of transitioning when people hear trans. So people sometimes conflate the, the trans um, prefix to mean that of necessity, people will and this is this is the verbiage that I often hear from people outside of community is transform. And that means an action of a process of modifying bodies to fit uh, orthodox kind of sex and gender identity. The focus is usually on that when the trans part is, from my perspective, is, is a journey. And it looks like a a different journey for different people. Um, some people don't have no no expectations of modifying their body through through surgeries or and or uh, uh, medical um, 
interventions. And some people do because that is important to them. It's each their own journey. And it shouldn't, I, I would like for people to take it away from that act of transitioning and more about the person's personal journey. Absolutely. And it's also like, um, as if cis people never transform in certain ways, right? Like there's, that's not a real binary. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you for saying that. So, I mean, this is something that we've, we've obviously all been talking about, but um, I'm wondering what are some of the other conversations that you've been um, speaking around when you're developing this project? Um, or maybe what are some of the ones that you hope to address further in the future? Well, for me, ideally, um, I think there's the reality of violence against Black trans women. I think um, oftentimes conversations, as well as research, uh, focus more on you know homicides and previous activities that was committed against um, Black trans women. Uh, so I think there is that component of violence and you know violence <laughs> prevention um, that that is of interest to me. I, I'm also I was very impressed with the conversations that we have been having around um, anti-Black racism and how that affects trans women's mental health. Um, you know, um, it's very much connected to how folks show up in community, how folks show up when they're dating and, and the expectations that come. So the fetishism or um, the assumptions, the stereotypes that um, uh, come when um, you're dating as a Black trans person. And uh, it's, you know, you can do your Google searches to, uh, uh, gets those stereotypes if you're interested in that. But um, yeah, it's going beyond that, going beyond the feelings of objectification and fetishism are really looking at like, what are the key qualities, you know, single women are looking for. And for some, it might be finances, you know, girls out here trying to get paid. Um, but for others, it's like, you know, it's love, it's, it's commitment. As Vanessa shared, like, you know, we did the, there is this love language quiz. And, and I, I did that quiz to see, you know, our folks having these conversations um, and what your love language is might not be what you think it is. And, and yeah, like, I think it's important that we not make assumptions that um, trans people do need support financially and otherwise because of some of the social and systemic issues. But beyond that, they are looking for holistic, you know, care. They're looking for someone maybe to spend time with, to um, enjoy quality and not so much like exploit it sexually. Um, so I think those are things that I'm interested in exploring further. We did ask a question specifically about uh, experiences of violence in the survey, as well as seeking help. And I'm interested in examining, you know, the responses to both of those questions um, and potentially developing something that's going to reduce violence against black trans women. And also there's this push for the last 10 years with trans women really expressing themselves and taking it from a place of being fetishized and being ostracized into the forefront and we being proud to of who we are and seeing we as the beautiful, gorgeous creatures we are. And we're not afraid to speak our minds and say, this is what I want. This is what I'm looking for. And I'm not gonna settle for anything else. And one of the things I like is that trans women are loving themselves first getting to know themselves first in order for them to really know who they want to, to be partnered with in life later on down the line. Also the idea that we're other and we're not just humans having a human experience, you know, um, and the, the idea that we're something other than um, human or wanting to be something that we're not. And we're just humans who are having human experiences like everybody else. I mean, who don't want to be loved and, 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 and um, cared for and being seen as the beautiful, gorgeous pusher they are? What do you wish people knew more about when it comes to dating and navigating relationships um, as an African, Caribbean and Black trans woman from the development of this project? From my personal experiences, the intersectional lens always takes precedence because people make assumptions on those intersections. We spoke about this in, in the project of how even in community, even in trans community, there's some um, lateral violence that happens in community around um, how trans someone is, how woman someone is, how femme someone is, and how that either advantages someone or makes them more vulnerable, even within community. 
and Tatiana, we've all had this this um, conversation around around um, looksism. I call it. Where, Possibility um, politics. Yeah, yeah I, I hate that term. Yes, I, I I try not to use it because it's such it's such a divisive and 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 unnecessary term. People show up in the bodies that they they come into the world in the bodies that they are. They, no, none of us choose the bodies that we're, we're in. And um, sometimes there's an alignment with, with um, the bodies that we're in and our gender identity. And we're learning through the experience, the multiple experience of trans people that there's sometimes there's a misalignment and that's all there is. Um, if, if everyone got to choose their bodies, before they came to the earth plane, then we'll all be, um, there would be no transness, so to speak, because I would have chosen a, a body that is, is, is female sex rather than male sex. And, but back to the point that I was making about the lateral violence that happens, how trans people in general, but more specifically trans women, are policed around um, the way they look and um, how if someone looks more close to cisset um, woman, then they navigate um, differently than someone who doesn't. And that that is not external to community, but sometimes is operational um, in community where we project onto uh, trans women and black trans women, how, how um, femme are you, how much you, woman you are or not. And if you, if you dare choose not to have uh, uh, surgical and medical intervention around your transness, then you're not trans enough. You're not a trans woman. You're not really a trans woman. So um, those are some of the things that we spoke about. Yeah, I have a few other things to add, but I wonder, Vanessa, do you, is there any uh, thing that's like, you know, fresh on your mind in regards to like some of the conversations we've been having in this development process? Well, I, I had a conversation yesterday with um, some, uh, some trans women that I know from the community and also from back home. And we had a discussion about if we had known ourselves as we know ourselves now, if we were to choose the partners that we had, because a lot of us had violent partners back then. And a lot of us came into this game seeing our, our oldest, um, the older generation taking care of men and even the girls taking sick, the, the, the guys abandoned them. Or they, they've been abused throughout this relationship. And I had to say, well, it's our past that experience that make us the strong trans women we are today. Fortunately, we are in the position now to teach the younger generation that to love yourself and that you deserve the best and no one needs to put their hand on you to prove that they love you. Yeah, yeah. And actually uh, reflecting on, I guess, something that Eva shared, I think it's, a, it's like a double-edged sword what I'm observing in the study so far in that there's been, as you can see, a lot of discussions about beauty and beauty standards and how folks show up. And that actually had um, caused me and Jade to think about, well, how are, you know, how are, how is this information being collected in, in other projects? You know, how, like, how is gender dysmorphia or body image? Uh, how, 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 how are these things being measured? And we didn't find any that really spoke to uh, the issues that, you know, were mentioned in regards to, you know, maybe blackness and, and passing privilege or what it means to be perceived as cisgender or, you know, what it means to have your, your gender be questioned all the time. Uh, so like, I think there's like this, there's this element that I'm still very fascinated by, like the thin line between gender affirmation, because on one hand, uh, folks are very proud and confident and, you know, they embrace who they are. But on the other hand, there's also this element of gender dysphoria, um, where there are elements that folks are a bit uncomfortable with, and, and all of it has to do with their overall presentation. So I think that's something that I'm very fascinated um, about. And uh, while it's not part of our entire project design, 
something else that like really, I think stood out for me was the conversations that we had around, like who has influenced people's perception of their gender. And, and many of the consultants really reflected on their moms. So the relationship of, you know, trans myths and, and motherhood. And some people don't have those relationships with their parents. You know, some people become estranged when they come out or transition. But to know that or to hear that, you know, the consultants felt so, are so proud of their mom. Like their mom represents these essence of femininity that they wanted to embrace and, and kind of, I guess, mimic um, was, was something that I think is very reassuring because I think we don't also talk about um, that too. We, I think when it, due to, you know, LGBT humanness, we often talk about the families that are broken and, and the tougher relationships. So we, we haven't, we have yet to explore like, you know, what does a positive relationship with, you know, parents look like? And in this case for trans women, what does a, a mother-daughter reunion in this new state look like? Because I think there's also that, you know, it's a journey for everyone. And some people's moms, um, you know, may be more accepted now compared to when they first came out. Uh, some people may have not had an opportunity to make those amends, but I think it's still a discussion worth having. And yeah, I mean, I don't know. I really don't know where, if someone's gonna take that work on, but I think that um, was a nice complimentary discussion that we were having in this project. And Jade, I don't know, do you wanna talk a little bit about what the experience has been um, trying to find survey measures um, to address the concerns that were raised in the project? Yeah, um, I remember one of our meetings, we, it was almost the entire meeting, um, we talked about when we're asking these questions, how do we ask them, you know, um, so I think one of the answers for like rate your attractiveness or how do you uh, feel about yourself, you know, one of the answers was possibly like, what, why does it matter? Or like, um, and then others were like, um, I'm beautiful. And then others were like, I feel perfect. So I think we had to, we thought really deeply about the words that in the choices we use and then how that might affect the answers in the quiz. And I think we did leave a box of like self-describe so you can create an, um, your own authentic answer if one of those doesn't uh doesn't fit but i think when we look at the survey of the respondents so far the answers are just so wide and different and it really speaks to like just how different we perceive ourselves and so that was really um cool to see you in the surveys and we talk a lot about that um in our, in our meeting i want to toss this out to everyone is there anything that sticks out as the most surprising thing that you've encountered about this project so far my sexual identity all of my life i thought that i was um transgender which I am but I'm also realizing that I'm also non-binary that's amazing Vanessa if you wouldn't mind sharing just a little bit about that self-discovery if you're comfortable yeah I mean like um Kathy Adam was touching on about how we see ourselves and how we navigate the world and that sort of stuff I'm always a person that if I'm going out I'm always glammed up and full and you know, but if I'm at home and I'm navigating, uh, walking through my neighborhood, living my everyday life, I don't have on no lashes, no wig, no makeup, no earrings. Tatiana could uh, attest to this because I met her the other day and um, I get hit on more I, I, when I perceive myself looking my worst. Because when I'm glammed up, no, the, the guys stay far. They will say, oh, you're, you're beautiful. But they don't come and talk to me. But when I am like a regular, degular person walking through and navigating the world, I get hit on. Um, when I went to meet Tatiana and I was at uh, Fink Station, at this, this, this Caribbean man came to me. We sat down. We had a whole conversation for like 20 or a half an hour. And he never asked me my sexuality or anything like that. I don't know what his, his perception of, was of me, but for me, I, 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 it was a normal conversation and we bid our farewells and that's it. And, and I realized, you know what? Yes, I may be transgender, transgender but I'm also non-binary. I don't see myself as just trans. Thanks for sharing that. Um, has you. anything else anything else come up that's especially surprising so far? It's not such a su surprise for me. It's just a reminder um, that um, nothing is a monolith. No one is no group of people. No, no, no one is a monolith. 
And it, again, we, I go back to this idea of a journey and not a destination. And um, there are, for some people, there are many iterations of, of self in that journey, journey as uh, Vanessa um, stated. We're all on a journey learning and unlearning something about self and other. And it looks like different things to different people and that's okay. And, um, you know, this, I, I remember, I remember how hard it was for me to accept my transness. Coming from Jamaica and in a time and era when you're either heterosexual or gay, and there's no, there's no um, diversity mm -hmm. in those um, pale, uh, poles in terms of gender and sexual uh, identity. So I grew up always being told, no one bothered to ask me um, who I was and how I was experiencing life. They looked at me, a very femme child, had no, no option than to be femme, and um, just decided I was gay. And people told me that I was gay all my life. So I grew up until, I won't say until uh, how old, I'm still 35, I'm just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> until I came, I migrated here, and then I'm looking around and I'm, I'm, I'm in a place where I'm freer in terms of expressing myself and, and, and living my truth in terms of um, sexual orientation. And, and then it hits me, what I was told I, I was, was not connecting with how I see myself in community. And it took me a long time to to be brave enough to accept my transness because I came into a place where it should be, it should be more freer, it should be all love and and but trans women were being seen as other and not in a in a positive light always. And it took me a while to to, even though I've always had notions that I I was not a boy, um, didn't know how to name it, but it took me a long time, a long time to kind of claim my transness. And um, that was kind of like, it still is a journey. And I still open myself to the journey of it. If I might say, I think one of the things that um, I really popped out, oh, I'm sorry, my cat, uh, really popped out to me was in my research, not only how little research there is on um, the experiences of uh, Black trans women, but the research that I did see was always like Tatiana uh, talked about was always in such a negative light. So the violence, the pain, um, and uh, just kind of like all of the negative experiences, but I really couldn't find anything on the positive parts of being a Black trans woman. Um, so nothing about love, nothing about family, nothing about really um, positive community, if it was talking about a positive community, it was a positive community in response to something violent or something terrible. Um, so that's one thing that just really popped out to me doing um, all of my lit reviews and my research. Yeah, there are, there are a few things I think that really stand out to me. Like, obviously I'm, I'm leading this project. So um, I think the fact that it is very community led, it's not um, me assuming what community needs are. I'm, are relying heavily on the insights from my consultants um, to help me put things into context. Like when we talk about attraction, what does that really mean? Like where where's the discomforts coming from? When we talk about um, expectations, you know, those key motivators, whether it's financial um, or otherwise, like where where is that coming from? Um, we have had conversations about, you know, Black trans women and sex work, but we also didn't want to prioritize that because um, that would come under if you are motivated. Like I think we're capturing like sex work in a in a way that's um, not stigmatizing. Um, so some folks are some folks don't consider their clients their lovers. So that's a very different ball game. The that is different. Um, we've also had conversations about um, risk factors. You know, um, like HIV exposure and STBBI exposure, and um, I think all of that information is very important. But um, what really, what I'm most impressed by and what I'm really looking forward to examining further is, like I said, 
violence prevention, because as Vanessa shared, like a lot of trans women may be experiencing violence or they may be in toxic relationships, but they feel like they have no other choice. So they stay and they just um, endure abuse that sometimes often results in, in you know, the unfortunate uh, loss of life. Um, but uh, where are opportunities for sisters and to intervene? Where are opportunities for, for change, to, to help to change people's perception of, you know, what is a healthy relationship? Someone doesn't have to be abusive uh, to you or feel like they own you for you to feel love. Um, and really supporting folks through that, because I think a lot of that is really linked to the trauma, like anti-Black racism and mental health. If you've experienced so much rejection from your family, then obviously you're, you're more tolerant of, of abuse. Um, not for everyone, but I would say usually there becomes more tolerance because it, 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 it's been normalized. You've, been, you've accepted this as something that's normal. And it's like to have someone, whether it's a professional, a clinician, a peer support worker, but to have someone really say like, no, like you, you, you have all this potential. Um, you don't have to tolerate that. I think could change the trajectory that um, trans women are, are, a lot of trans women are on. Um, and also give them options for them to know like, okay, this is what I'm experiencing. If I don't like this, then I, I know that I can go to community or I can access these resources um, for help. And I think those are some of the things that I, that's surprising and that I really hope to examine further because it's still, we're still in the process of collecting more information. Um, yeah. If, um, if our listeners wanna support this project, is there any way um, for them to do so? Is there anything you need um, from people at this stage in development? Um, or should I just drop a link in the episode notes and have people uh, check it out online? Yeah, I think um, definitely there's a, we're still doing recruitment. We want to have a diverse sample. I think another thing that's a bit surprising, but not so much surprising is the fact that our, our, um, our community engagement has been relatively young. Um, so if there are, you know, older trans folks or seasoned as uh, the team like to say, no one wants to be called old, clothes get old, not people. Uh, but uh, if there are trans folks who are, you know, um, over the age of 50 or even over the age mature of- Mature trans women. Mature it is. <laughs> if there are these women um, in Canada um, that will be interested in and in talking about, you know, what their experience has been, you know, aging as a trans woman, um, growing in love or, you know, disconnecting, prioritizing their own love life, um, we'd love to engage them in this study because our study has been pretty young. Um, you can find more information by contacting me. Uh, uh, my email can be provided. And yeah, sharing our materials. Like we would really love to engage more trans women in these very important discussions about uh, sex, love, and marriage. Uh, I was hoping we could end on a light and fun note. Um, so if anyone has anything joyful or wonderful that happened to them that they wanted to share, um, or alternatively, if anyone here has any advice for our listeners um, on love and dating, um, all is welcome. Love yourself first, but you not what makes you, you. And then in turn, love, uh, then you can find that person that you think that you really want to be or need to be. And also, I'm going through the sex reassignment surgery soon. Awesome. awesome. Sending you lots of love. Yeah, sending you some positive energy. I'll jump in then. Um, we get to determine how we love and who we love. And sometimes that looks like orthodox, sometimes unorthodox, and it's okay. And the, the, the only caveat to that is that uh, you find we find compatibility someone who wants what we have to give we have what they want as well and um no one gets to tell anyone how they should love and who they should love it's just compatibility and and two or more people who find compatibility I think I'll, I'll echo what Vanessa and Eva said, but also value yourself. Um, I think that's one thing I learned in this is before you can love yourself, before you can do anything, you need to give your, you need to recognize your own value and celebrate that. Um, and on that note, Black History Month is approaching. We will be continuing this discussion 
or having a similar discussion, I should say, around Black love, sex, and sexuality. So stay tuned to that event. You can visit uh, the SDS website to find out the exact date. Tentatively, it's February 18th. Um, and I'm delighted to, you know, share our information this spring. So for, for me, the main piece of advice is, you know, stay tuned. And, and if you enjoy this content, if you enjoy this type of discussion, uh, please show up. Gorgeous. Thank you so much for that. Um, Ava, Vanessa, Jade, Tatiana, this has been beautiful. Um, my heart is full. I hope that our listeners are as thrilled as I am. Um, and make sure you check back and engage with this project. Thank you all very much.